when you go to the Louvre and queue for so long just to see the Mona Lisa, what is it that you see? A painting, you might answer. And yes, that's absolutely true. But what do you actually see? What is the Mona Lisa made of? And what are all the art and historical objects made of? When having a closer look, we see that the building blocks of all tangible heritage are atoms, molecules, and crystals. And today we're going to learn about all of them. And if you stay until the end, you'll get to learn how crystals were responsible for catching a famous art forger. We've already seen in a previous video how cultural heritage is made up of tangible heritage and intangible heritage. Today we'll have a closer look at tangible heritage and we'll see what are the building blocks of heritage materials. Let's start with the atom. This is the usual representation of an atom. But what does it mean? It tries to depict the structure of an atom. What you see here as the central ball, that's the nucleus. And surrounding the nucleus are these other tiny particles called electrons. Now let's have a look at the nucleus and see what it is made of. It is made up of two types of particles that are shown here for demonstration purpose only as red particles and blue particles. These are called protons and neutrons. The protons are positively charged particles and the neutrons are neutral particles. And remember that surrounding the nucleus were the electrons. These are negatively charged particles circling around the nucleus. To better understand what's happening in the atom, let's have a look at the schematic representation of the atom. Here we can see the positively charged nucleus. The positive charge is coming from the presence of the positively charged protons inside the nucleus. The negatively charged electrons that are circling the nucleus are attracted by the positive charge of the nucleus, thus keeping the atom together. But how is it that the nucleus holds together if it's made up of positive particles and neutral particles? Why is it that these positive charges don't repulse one another and try to fly away as far away as possible from one another? It's because of a force that binds together the protons and the neutrons. This is called the strong nuclear force, but it's outside the scope of our topics here. But I just wanted to reassure you that the nucleus is there and it stays together and you don't need to worry about it falling apart. So now let's get back to those electrons. They are organized on different shells surrounding the nucleus, represented here by the blue circle and the orange circle. So the shells closer to the nucleus, that is the blue circle here, have a lower energy than the ones that are further away, represented here by the orange circle. The lower energy shells get populated first, and when they are filled with the maximum number of electrons allowed in that shell, then the outer shells get populated. The number of electrons around the nucleus is equal to the number of protons inside the nucleus. And this gives us the atomic number, which is the number of protons in the nucleus. This is a number that is specific to each element in the periodic table. And the elements in the periodic table are organized function of their increasing atomic number. So if we look at the first element, that's hydrogen. And the number shown above it is its atomic number. For hydrogen, the atomic number is one. That means it has one proton. Moving on to the next element, that's helium. Its atomic number is two. And you can see here, helium has two protons. Hydrogen and helium are the only two elements in the first period, that is the first row of the periodic table. The next element, with the atomic number three, is in the second row of the periodic table. This element is lithium, and it has three protons. But as I said before, the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons. But the first shell can only hold two electrons. So when we add the third electron, we have to move to the next shell, the orange one, which can hold up to eight electrons. And the next shell, which is not shown here, could host up to 18 electrons. So the further we go in the periodic table, the more shells we add in order to accommodate all the electrons of the heavier elements. Going back to the periodic table, we see that the further we go in periods and down the groups, the higher the atomic number. So we'll have to add more and more protons in the nucleus and more electrons surrounding it. Let's have a look at one more element. 
Let's take magnesium, for example, with an atomic number of 12. Third row, second group. That means that magnesium has 12 protons in the nucleus. So now we have to add 12 electrons in the shells, that is 2 electrons in the first shell, 8 electrons in the second one, and we still have 2 more electrons, which we will place in a third shell. These shells and the electrons, and how the electrons can move from one shell to another, will be very important when we will discuss in future videos about different scientific methods that can be used in cultural heritage. It is especially important when we'll talk about X-ray fluorescence. That's my favorite technique that's used in cultural heritage. You'll see, you will love it. So if you don't want to miss that video, please subscribe to my channel and remember to hit the bell button to get notified when I upload new videos. Let me know in the comments if there's a scientific technique that you love or that you would love to learn about in the future. Now that we've explored together the periodic table and its elements, why are they so important to cultural heritage? In this channel, we talk a lot about tangible heritage. And we also talk about the different scientific methods that can be applied to study the different objects of tangible heritage. And some of these methods are better suited than others to study the objects made from the different elements of the periodic table. While in future videos we will talk about the scientific methods, today we'll talk more about the building blocks. So we're talking about atoms, molecules, and crystals. And now that we've learned about the atoms, next we will learn how these atoms associate to form molecules. There are different types of bonds that the elements can form with one another. But what's important here is to know that they can associate together to form molecules with different degrees of complexity. Let's have a look at a simple molecule. Only three atoms. One oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. You probably recognized it. It's the water molecule. And the water molecule is formed by binding these two hydrogen atoms to the oxygen atom. Why, you may wonder, do we care about water in cultural heritage? We care a great deal about water in cultural heritage. That is because the humidity, that is water, can lead to the aging of the art objects, and that, in turn, leads to the deterioration of the art objects. Similarly to creating a simple molecule, like water, by putting three atoms together, we can do the same with a larger number of atoms and a larger variety of elements, as you can see here. The molecules I'm showing here are not necessarily heritage-relevant molecules. I just wanted to show you a variety of molecules some more complex than others. Now molecules can associate further to form crystals. So starting from one molecule, you can form a variety of different types of crystals. This can vary depending on how many molecules there are in the unit cell, how these molecules are arranged with respect to one another, how big is the unit cell. All of these can vary from one crystal structure to another. And these types of crystal structures are called polymorphs. And that's another one of my favorite topics. Here is an example of what a crystal structure looks like. This is a simple crystal structure made up of titanium and oxygen atoms, and it's called titanium dioxide. Each atom has an exact position in this unit cell. And by translating this unit cell in all the directions of space, we create the material which is based on the composition and structure of that unit cell. And in this case, that material is titanium white. It is a white pigment that is used in paintings. Now here's a fun fact about crystals in art that I was telling you about in the beginning. It's about how a famous art forger was cut because of the crystal that I've just shown you before, the titanium white pigment. His name is Wolfgang Beltraki, and he's a famous contemporary art forger. He had a very successful career as an art forger. That was until he was caught because of the titanium white pigment. Scientific analysis of one of the paintings that he sold revealed the presence of the titanium white pigment in the painting. The problem was that pigment should not have been there in the painting at the time when Beltraki said that the painting was made. We will talk a lot more about Beltraki and other art forgers in future videos. But if you want to learn more about Beltraki now, I will link down in the video description a blog post that I wrote about him. 
If you enjoyed this video and you enjoyed learning about atoms and molecules and crystals, then please give it a thumbs up and please share it with other people who would also like to learn about the building blocks of tangible heritage. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in future videos when we can explore together the wonders of heritage. Bye, see you next time!